RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. The museum itself started in 2008 and we were just doing a little little event. We, we didn't expect many people to turn up. In the end we had almost 70 people turn up. And for a little event from nowhere, I was quite happy with that. Everybody loved what we did and it just got bigger from there. Um, it was just storage for a start because we, we, I ran out of room in my garage. Um, and then we, we started doing bigger events, we got bigger premises, then we moved to Leicester. Since we moved to Leicester we became a charity and then uh, that was in 2012. And then since then it's just got bigger and bigger and bigger. It's always been really chilled, really, you know, laid back. We don't want to, we don't want to be um, seen as being too stuffy and too poor and too, you know, we're all geeks, we're all nerds, yeah, I'll take that. But we also, we get a lot, a lot of families now on, on the, when we have the and some weekends and stuff. Hello, Cave Dwellers. That was Andy there, the boss at the Retro Computer Museum, introducing us to the origins of the museum, and we will hear more from him later. What you're seeing is clips of the night before the morning after, an event held on the Saturday at the museum which involved gaming, our friend Ravi DJing with his Amigas, and a warm, warm welcome from the likes of Tony, Sylvia, Chris, Simon, Rebecca, Andy of course, and everyone else who I met. My intention was to create this tour for you on the Saturday but I quickly realised I should just down tools and enjoy the day and then give filming another shot on the Sunday so that's what I did and the next day we began in the library. And what a treat there is for you in here. This is the heart of the museum. Over 40,000 games, applications and books that you can browse freely. This isn't special treatment for me because I'm filming. Anyone can experience this and it's just mind-blowing. If you can think of it, it's probably in here. From PC to Commodore 64, MSX to Master System, I could spend weeks in here. This being the UK, the Amiga is very well represented in the library. And look at these lovely, lovely Cinemaware titles. That's three more copies of Rocket Ranger than I own. It's been a long time since I saw this many big box titles in one place and I'm so, so pleased to see so many simulators. The unmistakable Microprose name standing out on every single shelf that I look at. This one I used to love, Birds of Prey. You could choose from about 40 planes I think it was in this and I remember flying the Blackbird straight up until the sky turned black. And if you wanted to get higher, then you'd want Shuttle to take you all the way into space. If you could figure out all the switches that was, this was some serious simming. The consoles too are well represented with everything from the Xbox to the Atari 2600 and this stuff is stacked high. I'm six foot tall and I can't get anywhere near the top shelves in here. I, I just want to play Warcraft 2. Tapes were far more popular here in the UK than discs in the 8-bit era and we've got them for every system. These shelves are four tapes deep in places and you may have already spotted that the collection isn't shy of a few duplicate copies. You want Robocop on the ZX Spectrum? Well I've got at least four copies to choose from on this shelf alone. Look, a three-headed monkey. Just the three monkey islands over here on the Amiga shelf and also his Guy Spy which like so many Amiga titles I've never seen a boxed copy of. It could be claimed that I'm as guilty as anyone of having copied that floppy back in the day. The Amstrad CPC corner is stacked with the budget label Codemaster, Mastertronic and Hit Squad tapes. It's just like being in a shop back in the 80s. And some games like the awesome Last Ninja 2 still have their shop labels on. Oh and look, more Robocop. The popular titles overwhelmingly grab your attention. 
But when you start to scratch the surface and dig into the dark corners, you find things like this collection of cartridges for the Amstrad GX4000 and Plus range. Oh, and what's this? More Robocop. I'm starting to think Robocop is actually a virus that's assimilating the other titles in here. Craft is an Amos expansion I've never seen in the shops, and it's flanked by four copies of Amos and four more of Amos Professional. Francois Lionet would be proud. And look up above it, it's a boxed copy of Directory Opus, an application that I think every Amiga owner had, but once again, very, very few would have seen a boxed copy of it. But we can go one better than that. What about this? It's a boxed copy of Xcopy, the tool we used to use to copy our floppies on the Amiga. Surely this is the only retail copy that ever sold. I didn't even know you could get this thing through legitimate channels. Allegedly. Then I found some Dragon 32 titles. These are really nicely packaged. I don't remember seeing these big boxes in the wild, only small cassette cases for the Dragon. And another hidden gem, tucked away here, we've got tapes which still have their card backing on to hang on the peg in the shops. It's incredible that these have survived, you'd expect them all to have been ripped open decades ago. It just goes on and on and on, and if the software isn't enough, there's a whole wing of books with every operating system, programming language or application manual you could need, including buried away in the dummies books, the first book that taught me C programming. Two books written by Dan Gookin, who very kindly replied to me by email back in the mid 90s when I was a young but enthusiastic coder. Supporting the library is a growing collection of magazines, many of them in their original binders, so you can read that elusive copy of Dr. Dobbs' Journal of Computing Calisthenetics? Calisthetics? Calisthenics? Dr. Dobbs' Journal of Computer Calisthenics and Orthodontia from 1978 for those running light without overbite. Hopefully you get the sense of the overwhelming nostalgia in the library. It really is like a time machine. I almost expect my BMX bike to be waiting outside for me to ride home on, having carefully selected a tape or magazine with my pocket money. Incredible stuff. But the museum has more hidden gems. Join me now in the next room where we meet Simon, keeper of the virtuality machines. So Simon, this is the, the VR part of the museum. It is, yes. Yeah. And Leicester has quite a strong connection to this virtuality equipment, doesn't it? What's the yes. connection? Well, John Walden, who started the company as W Industries, uh, was at Leicester Polytechnic, which is now, as far as I know, uh, De Montfort University. I may be corrected on that. It may be Leicester University. I'm not sure which way it is. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so Leicester Polytechnic, he started out with the idea of uh, working on, well, virtual reality but in the very early stages. Uh, it's all Leicester based. He got a team of three other people, so four including himself. Virtuality, well, not virtuality, W Industries was formed officially, I think, in 1988. And they, say, they were working on development systems. Quite quickly, they moved on to, started using their style headsets, but uh, some earlier concepts of those, which uh, Richard Holmes designed at home. He was, he was the lead designer, a technical designer and he started building headsets in his garage in a with a, using a vacuum forming machine. Right. A, a guy, I'm not sure of his name, who owned Wembley Stadium at the time, went to John Walden and said, here is some money, and virtuality in the form of sit-down machines were officially launched on November 22nd, 1991. W Industries and virtuality, um, really, really progressed very, very, very quickly on getting a VR system working. Uh, so these machines are about £60,000 new, one of these would have been. Uh, I just think the technology was there as much as it possibly could have been. These have Amiga 3000s in them, mm. and they are running as fast as they possibly can with custom graphics cards. So Virtuality actually invented technology to get it where they wanted it to be. By standards, the machines have two graphics cards in. 
Right. One, one for each eye. Okay. Give you stereoscopic vision. Um, they will run with one graphics card. And I've managed to accumulate quite a few of non-working VR systems because the Amiga has failed. Right. But I've still got the graphics cards. Yes. I've yeah. got enough graphics cards in these machines to probably duplicate over a couple of times. And I've got about seven or eight at home. So I've got spare graphics cards. I have had Oculus Rift developers come here and tell me the, the tracking is better on this than it is in an Oculus Rift. Wow. I'd say the reason is the tracking device on these machines to replace it now is getting on for six thousand pound plus. The Amiga three thousand is inside there. So you can't see the Amiga. It's sitting beneath the circuit board. That's the tracking device. That's the really expensive bit. Um, that is called a format board. But all it really does is sorts out the internal and external audio systems, buffers the graphics chips. Uh, so if it's a problem, it doesn't blow the graphics card, it blows the chips on here instead. Um, powers the tracking system. Uh, and down here, it trims the joysticks on the sit down machines. Uh, underneath there is the, the 3000. Amiga's really uh, tucked away under It there. is, yeah. If there's any the problem. Same setup in, in the sit down cabinet. It is exactly the same computer. The only difference is, is the tracking system. On the stand up machine, it tracks your head and it tracks the gun. On the sit down machine, it only tracks your head, so it's a, a, a lower end tracking system. Yeah. I say lower end, it's only tracking one device. Well, the, the, the idea of the main room is to, we, we, we did have the idea of, of having like separating the, the consoles and the computers, but in the end we decided not to because we have people tend to congregate in certain areas. I mean, we've got four player stuff in there, we've got two player stuff, we've got single player stuff. So the idea of that room really is just to bounce around a little bit. So from there, we've got we've, our entrance area is also a little shop area, we've got a little bit of a kitchen back there as well. And then to, to the, as you come into the building, onto your, to your left hand side, there's our library. Our library's um, quite vast. It's, it's got a lot of um, various games. We think we've got over 40,000. When we moved to this building, which was three years ago, we, we got to 28, well, no, 25, 26,000, I think it was, and we sort of gave up counted at that point um, because it was just ridiculous. We couldn't get that many donations. We've got duplicates of lots of machines. We've got, you know, um, I mean, we've got our Amiga collection and our, well, our Commodore. Um, collection and our Sinclair collection is phenomenal. It's, it's, um, it's quite scary really. Yeah. Um, but people say, why do you need that many machines? Well, things break down. Yeah. Custom chips inside, inside you know, Commodore 64s, inside the Amigas. Um, and I think, I personally, I'm one of these people that I'm not, I guess we're a bit of a hoarder, but I, I don't think you could ever have enough. I think you could have, you could have 100 Amigas and still not have enough because we, you know, we, we aim to keep this up for a long time. Yeah. But what, we've, what we're slowly but surely doing is we've got an area in this, this chill out area. Um, we've got glass cabinets anyway. Mm -hmm. And in the glass cabinets, we've got one or two rare machines. We've got the one with the Amiga here. It's yeah, not that's ours. the gold it's on, Amiga. The gold Amiga, yeah. It's on, it's on um, a friend of mine owns it. He, he sort of lets have it on display for a while. How did they get hold of it? Um, I don't, I don't okay. really know that much about it, to be fair. I know it was, um, I know it was purchased at an auction, and I know you paid quite a lot of money for it. Right. It's got the certificate of authenticity with it, isn't it? Yeah. So um, we've got Atari Falcon there, which is not not mega rare, but quite rare. Mm -hmm. um, but inside the cabinet, we have got the prototype of the CD1200. Yeah, and that really which is, is one of the very kind. rare. Yes. Um, well, we've heard now that maybe two still floating around. Okay. So um, we're not entirely sure. Um, I have I have spoken to Beth. The lady that designed it, and she was so um, excited to hear that at least one existed still, because she, you know, she, and it's her writing on the back of the actual device, and you know, it says number two, um, revision zero, I think. Mm -hmm. No, no, number two, revision zero, that's right. Um, so she's, um, she was really excited, and she does hope to actually visit. So what have we learned on our visit today? 
Well, as usual, there's far too much to show you in one short video, which is why you really need to come and see it for yourself. The Saturday event was a great chance to hear from visitors on what they thought on the museum, and the feedback that I got was consistent and unanimous. They didn't come simply for the machines, they came to visit for the community. This is a space to relax in the company of like-minded people as much as it is to show the younger generation the history and heritage of computers and consoles in a hands-on fashion. And that's why so many people that I met are repeat visitors. They come back time and time again to enjoy Andy's endless hospitality and a space where they feel at home in the company of friends. And if you're still not convinced, then just come and visit that library, wallow in the software TARDIS, and smile from ear to ear like a kid with pocket money burning a hole in your pocket. You really won't regret it. Thank you so much to Andy and the team for their hospitality, and thank you for watching. Links to the museum and related information can be found in the video description. I hope you enjoyed our trip today, and take care. If you enjoy my content and would like to support the cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.